As a heads up, this video presentation is a lesson demonstration workshop covering a few hours. Our Twitch Tuesday lessons disappear after a while, but we re-record them here so you may enjoy them long after our Twitch sessions are over. Hi everyone, this is Howard from Ford or Learn to Fly. Today we're going to be covering the legendary, the classic, the most fun you can ever have in an airplane, the de Havilland Canada DHC2 Beaver. Amphibious, skis, wheels, bush wheels, in and out of anywhere in the world, one of the most iconic aircraft of all times, the de Havilland Canada Beaver. Let's get rolling, everybody. We're going to go into a presentation that I've developed for our Tuesday evening lessons on Twitch. So every Tuesday evening at 5 p.m. Eastern, we have our Tuesday lesson, and we learn something about flying. In many cases lately, we're learning a new airplane, and that's the case here. This ended up being a three-hour Twitch session. We're going to keep it down, of course, lower than that here on this YouTube channel, but we want to make sure that you get an insight on what we're learning, how to learn how to handle confidently this airplane in all its configurations and different phases of flight. And that's the, the purpose behind all of this. I certainly encourage your comments down below. Put them in there. Let us know. Help us learn more. All of us can collectively learn from each of your experiences. And uh, let us know, good or bad, what you think about this video series and whether it's all worth the effort to make these things happen. Um, and uh, we'll be able to... Um, take a look at a deeper insight onto how to fly a plane other than just spawning into a runway and hitting the throttle. And that's the whole idea behind uh, these lessons is to get to know the airplane more. I have been in the many Beaver airplanes in different flights in my business travels, mainly when I get to the West Coast, mainly when I'm in Comox or Vancouver or Victoria, those areas where I've been on business in my free time or after classes are over, I head down to the seaplane bases and see if anybody's doing a check ride or if anybody's doing a, a practice something or if anybody's doing a water taxi, I'll jump in and I'll ask if I can come aboard. Many times I find myself in the right seat and I get to see them in action. So maybe that'll help here in the session too, so you can see what's going on with each of these things. But I do want to start off by just talking about the uh, disclaimer here. I'm not a CFI. I don't teach lessons for real in airplanes. I teach IT courses. It's teaching skills. It's being in classrooms or remote like we are now. But the flying part, as a real pilot, the flying part is just my love, my passion, and uh, the part that I love the best. And I fly it every chance that I can get. I typically rent Cessnas 172 and 150s. And... Uh, but anyway, with that information, with knowledge of flight and with teaching skills, I like to put together these lessons and it draws quite a crowd. So that's what's here. I'm sharing my knowledge. Lots of fun. There's a nice, beautiful shot of a group fly that we did. There I am in the beaver with a sunset. A bunch of these people are actually with us in multiplayer and multi in uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator. All right, so the de Havilland Canada DHC2 Beaver, this is it. Now, if you see my eyes shifting, you guys, it's not because I'm a shifty person. I'm looking at other screens. My main presentation screen is that way. The main recording screen is this way. And all of the other screens that I use for flying are all here in front of me. So um, right now, I'll be looking mostly toward that direction at the presentation screen as we go along. This is right out of the simulator. Look how real that looks. It's gorgeous. Um, there's no extra scenery, no extra anything added here. I will mention that I've added the 40th anniversary enhancement for the Beaver. Uh, and what that does is allow us to have skis. That's one thing that it allows. And there's a few other things that we'll talk about as we go along. But um, what you're seeing here is exactly what you get in the simulator. This is a free aircraft included in the 40th anniversary. And so we're just having a lot of fun with it. And, uh, and, and it's become my favorite plane. Well, it always was my favorite plane, and now it's here in the sim, then I'm going to fly it a lot more, that's for sure. 
All right, so let's do a bit of background here. I'm just going to move myself out of the way so we can read this. You can see in here, 1946, de Havilland focused its attention on the design and development of a rugged, highly versatile bush plane that could take off and land almost anywhere. All right, and you know, it's it, it was mainly designed for Canada's most remote northern regions, northern Ontario, northern Quebec, northern any province, northern British Columbia, interior BC, you know, all that stuff where they need a versatile airplane to get in and out of small grass strips, small lakes, uh, almost anywhere that people are inhabiting. So they christened the new plane the DHC-2 Beaver. Now to do this, they actually made a survey, sent it out to, I think it was around 2,000 bush pilots in Canada, and asked them, if we were to make a new airplane, what would you want? Well, they came back with great responses saying, you're actually going to ask us what would be the best or ideal airplane. And they got an overwhelming response. The bottom line in some of that summary, you guys, is that simply that they stressed that it must be rugged and reliable, highly versatile, and capable of taking off and landing nearly anywhere and on all types of terrain, including snow and water. And they said, oh, uh, and another thing, while handling at least a half ton payload, well, they kind of chuckled at that and said, you realize that such a plane would have poor performance. And the response, as you can see here in front of you on the right, this plane, the, the, the bush pilots were saying, the plane just needs to be faster than a dog sled. And that is still being used in the remote north, everybody. It's the only way to get around in some places. Certainly snow machines, snowmobiles are taking over that role, but it's still... All right, let's call it faster than a snowmobile <laughs> and, and carry those kind of loads. So that's how it, be, how it came about. And I'll talk about some of those enhancements as we go along, as we see the airplane, as we look at different parts of it. We'll see these enhancements that they've put into the design of the airplane. All right, so I want to talk about first the uh, the specifications here. Now I'm in the way here of the the ones at the bottom here, but I'll just come. I'll step back out again just to, so you can see what it is. I didn't design the slides for where I was going to be placed on the screen, but I certainly designed them so that we can enjoy this beautiful airplane. These are all screen snaps from the flight simulator that I've got. These aren't uh, any other photographs that I've brought in, and uh, and then I've just played a bit with them. I, I got a lot of this information from the manual that comes with it or I've got this information from uh, de Havilland Canada websites or even from the for sale sites that will have information about these planes. Um, you can see in here it's got a, a single engine Pratt & Whitney R985 Wasp Junior radial engine and if you guys are under you know if you ever studied any of these Pratt & Whitney engines you'll realize that they're all over the world and uh, as Andrew pointed out, my co-host, on the uh, Twitch stream the other night, he pointed out that this very same engine is used in so many other airplanes, including the twin-engine G21 Goose. So, you know, there's a bunch of other airplanes that use the very same engine. Super reliable, plenty of horsepower, and, uh, and that's certainly what's made this thing the, the plane that it is today. I won't go through all the other um, criteria, but you can see there it says seats one passenger, sorry, one pilot and six passengers. And that's certainly important. You can also see on this list here, empty weight, 3,000 pounds, maximum gross weight, 5,100. So useful load, 2,100 pounds. And I've seen these things loaded up with oil drums. I've load, loaded them up with extra canoes. I've seen them loaded up with all kinds of cargo. Um, I've actually never been in a passenger version, but I've been in plenty of cargo versions of this plane and mainly in the BC area. Fuel capacity, 138 gallons, but that changes with uh, whether you have wing tanks, wind tip tanks or not, or whether you have a belly extended tank or not. But, you know, we, we can talk about those things as we go along. I do want to point out that, um, you know, here is the focus on the Pratt & Whitney radial engine, air-cooled, supercharged, nine-cylinder radial. This is the, the draw, and this is a beautiful engine. I mean, just to see this. We looked at this same sort of engine or a similar configuration of this kind of radial engine uh, when we looked at the uh, the 247, and there's a few other planes like the, uh, the Grumman Goose that use these radial engines back in the day. Uh, nine cylinders, everybody. And um, here you can see some of the detail. This is right in the sim. I've opted for the chrome spinner, or you can get a matte black spinner. And you can see in here uh, the cylinders, the intake valves and uh, exhaust valves, 
that operate and you can actually see a wire going to a spark plug you know stuff like that is that kind of detail um, in past lessons I have talked about radial engines and how they work and even shown a video a graphic um, moving video of the engines actually uh, the cylinders actually working to make the engine rotate and um, and these things take care and we have to understand how to do engine management properly uh, how to start it properly how to manage it during flight um, taking care of your engine as a pilot has always been paramount because we want to make sure that we can safely confidently take off and land all the time and keep this engine in pristine condition and that's the idea behind it all right so I do want to point out now the performance itself when you take a look at this screen and there it is on the ski version that you'll only get skis if you have regular wheels and then go pick skis on the tablet we'll show you that later on in this presentation how to do that but uh, this this skis are only available in what's called the 40th anniversary enhancement that you get on flightsim.to I do want to point out that in the ski version you only get that with the 40th anniversary enhancement not the 40th anniversary update that comes with the sim but this is an extra enhancement from flightsim.to that xbox users can't use yet all right for the ski version as you can see though the ski version is awesome with you to have this available for the airplane it is a typical scenario in the uh, the great white north take off over 50 foot obstacle your typical specification that you hear in any airplane uh 1000 feet rate of climb sea level almost 1300 feet per minute top speed of 179 miles per hour and the cruise speed of 137 so and then down to stall typical stall speeds now, i want to mention you guys these are all in miles per hour and and it's good to see this in miles per hour because the airspeed indicator is in miles per hour this is very important i fly cessnas in real life uh 172 is typically and um, the first thing i do when i go in to lower the flaps and do the walk around i glance over at the airspeed indicator because I have seen so many of them that are in miles per hour, knots, or kilometers per hour. It depends on whoever owned this airplane, and I rent them all the time. So whoever owns this airplane, whoever originally owned this airplane, opted for that kind of airspeed indicator. So if this one in the sim is in miles per hour, we want all the stats to be in miles per hour so that we can just keep thinking the same thing. Landing over a 50-foot obstacle, which is most common in these planes because they're sending them into remote areas, with trees everywhere for sure a um, thousand feet so a landing over a 50 foot obstacle over the 50 footer or higher down into that strip that just give me a thousand feet and i can put it to a stop i want a little more than that just in case <laughs> but this is really you know the range for this thing 578 miles now that's going to depend on which fuel tanks you have there are three fuel tanks in here by default um, we'll talk about that as we go along. And and surprisingly, they're not in the wings. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Like typical high-wing airplanes. So variants of the Beaver included in the sim. The left two are in there for sure. Um, when you get the 40th expansion, you also get the bush tires, and you also get the ability to add skis from the tablet, as you can see here. I've modified this right screen just so you can see the ski version over here. And that's beautiful. Now, I prefer... I certainly prefer floats and I've always been on amphib floats and most of the planes I've been in on amphib I've never actually been in the tail drag or beaver for real in real life but I do take it here for a demonstration and show you how that works if you have techniques uh, good techniques for tail wheel airplanes then you'll have this as no problem a little hint before you even get into the demonstration once that tail wheel lifts off the ground you're going to see a lot of left yaw going on as typical for most of these small ga planes that have a lot of torque up front you're going to have to do a lot of right rudder once that tail wheel comes off the ground right but that's anyway you don't have that problem with these uh with the float version you will have the same problem with the ski version once that tail ski comes off the ground all right we'll talk more about each of the variants and i'll give you demonstrations of each one of these airplanes as we go along here all right, so learning a new airplane. Now, this is the set, the standard seven steps that I provide when I'm teaching lessons on Tuesday nights on our Twitch channel. And um, I go through these same seven steps for everyone because these are the things you should do when you're learning a new airplane. So many of you will jump into the sim, fire up that new airplane, and just give it the throttle. And you manage to fly the thing. You manage to land the thing. You might bounce around. You might go inverted. You might have all kinds of trouble. But you said, hey, I can do that. 
and have no idea whether you're doing it right or not. And that's what these seven steps are for, everybody. And this is what my basic lessons are online. They're for learning the skills of flying. So here, the assumption is you have the skills of flying. You know about stalls. You know, they're actually wing stalls. They're not engine stalls. You know about what to do if you have a wing stall or if you're getting close to a wing stall. So hopefully you have those skills. If not, you should get some of those basic skills first. I do have online lessons for that, but certainly there are plenty of other resources to learn skills on flying. Now, so here in learning a new airplane now, transitioning to a new airplane, these are similar to what you go through when you do what's called um, a type certification. You would grab the pilot's operating handbook and study it inside out. You'd start out by learning the, vert, you know, the, the standard speeds that you need to know, the V speeds, like number two on the lesson here. Um, and then you have to get a checklist or make one. Learn about any extra things that are inside the plane, like the blue knob. Like in here, we do have a propeller knob, a propeller lever. All right. In some planes, they're actually color coded like they are on your Bravo throttle quadrant. Blue is for propeller. Uh, your constant speed propeller, it manages all of that. But we have to do certain settings for that. And we're going to uh, spend some time here learning about that. Uh, number six, cockpit orientation. Where is everything? Where's my flap switch? Where's my light switch? Where's my circuit breakers? Where are my standard instruments? Where's my navigation instruments? So we, get, we need to learn all of that. So I'm going to go through these steps in this session right now, all right, in the presentation, and then give you some demonstrations along the way as we go along. That's the whole idea behind it all. Okay, let's start with uh, step number one, obtain the pilot's operating handbook, the POH. Um, in Twitch chat, I just put an exclamation point beaver POH, but you'll see it in a link down below. This is allowed to be shared. Anyone can grab this. Grab that POH, everybody. just saves you looking for one. And this is what the cover looks like. Looks great, the Davil and Beaver flight manual. And it follows the convention of your typical POHs. You know that it has general information. Then it has, like, uh, emergency section 3. It has normal section 4. Uh, has additional supplemental material near the end. All of that, it's following that convention. As you can see in here, this one's March 31st, 1956. This is a 66-year-old manual. <laughs> and it still pertains today. And we're going to use this for flying this airplane. It's only one, one small area in the manual that I find not consistent with the sim, and that is because they made different variants of this plane the uh, auto rich auto lean mixture control here we don't have the auto rich auto lean sections we just have a variable mixture control well like we're used to in other ga planes and uh, so that's the only thing that was different in this poh so that's the one i've selected for this you notice that it says the Havilland aircraft of canada limited toronto ontario in fact that's where i'm from you guys that's where i live in the east end of toronto in scarborough uh, the downsview airport is only 10 maybe 15 minutes at rush hour to get there for here from from my home and i have to say that i'm very proud to say that that's where so many beautiful things have come in the aircraft industry from downsview airport you can't fly in there publicly right now but uh, uh certainly it's still being used for many things but that's also where the the um the dash eight dash seven all of those i saw those in the air in test flights all right, so grab the POH. That's the whole idea. We'll be referencing it all the way through. And here's an example of the table of contents. Here you can see each of the sections and what's in there. And that's just a start, you know. And, you know, these are the things, these are the skills we have to master to handle this beast. And we'll be referencing the POH, like in real life. We'll be referencing the POH as we go along. Here, we need to move out of the way here. You need to read the whole manual, highlight important parts, make checklist cards, and understand it top to bottom. Well, in fact, everybody, I've made a checklist for you, a simpler one than what they show in the POH, but I've used this POH to actually make my checklist item so I don't forget some things. I'll always have a checklist nearby or go find a real checklist, which is more elaborate. All right, for the most realistic setup, here's our first taste of what the beaver looks like from inside. Boy, does that look like 1956. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> All those nice curvy lines, those old looking everything. <laughs> conventional gauges, of course. This is the only modern add-on, and you can switch that out for conventional radios. All right, the standard Bendix King stack, which I'm used to seeing in these planes. But a lot of them have been upgraded and retrofitted to have 
you know, this is a standard uh, GNS 530-430 combination, which I've done in a previous YouTube video to understand how to manage that, uh, how to use them. And certainly that means that here in Microsoft Flight Simulator, you can use the autopilot panel down here, the CAP 140. You can use that to follow a flight plan that you've already made in the world map and come into the sim and it will follow it just fine, complete with all the autopilot, etc. This unique elbow yoke, I'll, I'll talk about it now because later on we just focus on everything else. This unique elbow kind of yoke that only works on one side of the plane can, when you're in level flight, you can move it over to the other pilot. Is that amazing or what? Um, and that's a really nice feature. Interestingly enough about this, <laughs> I should just add this in there. Interesting enough about this, I know a pilot who wanted to get checked out. He bought a Beaver like this. He wanted to get checked out by an instructor. Of course, they call it a checkout flight. You learn everything about it like we're doing now. And then you go with an instructor and they determine whether you are certified to take this thing solo, of course. And so that's called a type certification. So in this case here, the, the person who bought this plane now was searching for an instructor to do the type certification, those who, who can do that. And every single one that he encountered said, no way, there's only one yoke. I'm serious. And he finally found someone who said, yeah, no problem. And away they went, right? So I think, you know, when I talk to CFIs about this, I think the problem is they have no control whatsoever if the plane's in trouble. If somehow the plane gets out of control for that person doing the certification check ride, how can that instructor grab the yoke and do something? You know what I mean? So typically, you know, in, in planes that have two yokes, that's not a problem. So that's kind of an interesting story and in that it ended up being a, a happy ending, thankfully. So that's it. Now I'm saying in here, use your left hand for the yoke, right hand for the controls. Now you certainly can fly it from the right seat, certainly for you left hand users who are used to yoke in the right hand and controls in the left hand. And it can be flown from either side, but typically we fly these airplanes from the left side. The walk around is the start here. You see this right in the manual. I'm only pointing it out because it's very similar to other walk arounds. In my 172, your typical POH walk around starts again at the left door, but it goes backwards around in a counterclockwise as you check everything. Here, they're having you do it this way. And there's things that you have to check specifically as they mention in each of these steps. And I'm not going to go through all of them, but that's what you would go look for. But I do want to point out this number one here, check security of fuel filler. What? Where's that? And so I want to point that out. You, This is all stuff right out of the manual, you guys. You can see in here <clears throat> that the fuel tanks are here. I mentioned there's three of them. One, two, three, right there. And these three tanks are just simply called forward, center, and rear. Right down there in the center of gravity, directly in the same center of gravity area as the wings. There is only fuel in the wings if you have the optional wing tip tanks that you would, whoever owns the plane has to buy it and put them in. And, uh, and then you would have some fuel up there and you'd use those first, of course, or keep them balanced. But take a look here. This was one of the criteria that the Bush pilot said they wanted. Instead of climbing up on the wing to put fuel in, like a 172 or many high wing airplanes, they wanted to be able to service the fuel oil hydraulics from the dock or from the side of the plane without coming up on top. Now in a float plane, this thing would be rocking away while you're trying to put fuel in up at the top. But even on the ground, you could be in high winds and blizzards and whatever, and you're trying to get this thing ready to go. Well, I think in blizzards, they're probably not getting ready to go. But the point is that they want to service the thing on the dock or right beside the plane. And look, there's the fuel filters, the fillers for the front, center, and rear tank. So you'll see three of those right there. And other things that we want to service, they've kept in mind the pilot. All right. You can have the optional long range tank underneath and the optional wing tips, as I mentioned. The battery compartment actually slides in and the door closes. Um, I'm trying to think of the plane that I saw them do that in. Um, there's a there's a beaver in the, the movie, um, oh, sorry, in the movie that I saw, the movie called um, Sweet Home Alabama. In that movie, Jake actually slides the battery back in and closes the door. Now this is important because in cold weather, one of the recommendations in the POH and what I've heard from a real pilot who flies these planes in the coldest of weather, if you're staying overnight at that hunter's camp and flying out in the morning, typically that's done because you flew in just before dark and you cannot take off on the water at night. You know, you can't do night uh, water flying at night. So um, he actually takes the battery out 
Now, if this were hidden somewhere inside the plane or in the, the engine compartment, you know, like a typical car, you open the hood and there it is and there's a couple of terminals, you know, this had to be an easy thing for them to remove, take into their camp or into their warmer place where they are, whether it be a fishing shanty or a hunter's cabin or whatever, keep the battery warm and keep it filled up, of course, with um, uh, with distilled water, of course, these, you know, these batteries and then take it back out to the plane when you're going to start it up. All right. Isn't that interesting? And it had to be easily accessible. Take it out and take it inside, bring it back. And that's a very common thing to do in these rugged plains out in the north. All right. I don't think there's anything much else I have to see here. The oil tank filler is, is in the cockpit also. That's another criteria they asked for. Instead of being somewhere in that engine compartment, like in a 172, you open the little tiny door, you check the few, the stick, and there's also the place to put the fuel in, or sorry, the oil in. Uh, they wanted this done inside the warmth of the actual plane. Um, and also, that's also a way for them, this is important, you guys, it's also a way for them to um, dilute the oil. So uh, the recommended oils in the POH, of course, but in the coldest of climates, that oil is so thick like syrup, it's not good for that engine. Um, and so same with our cars too. If our cars in the cold north, if you don't use a plug-in heater, it, you know, it's called an engine block. If you don't plug your car in at night, you'll see it might have troubles in the morning. The battery will have less power. The engine will be struggling to get turned over. So here to take care of this engine, you can actually dilute, and it says it right in the POH, you can dilute the oil with some fuel. And they talk about 10%. 20%, 30%, depends on the temperature and all the rest of it. And you do this from inside the cabin. It's amazing, all right? And it's pretty cool. I've seen that in action. They put some fuel into the oil. Kind of interesting how they do all of this and how they figured stuff out. Kind of cool. The static ports back here, it's important to know that during the walk around because um, you want to make sure that's clear, that, that at, at least two instruments are uh, controlled by the static port. And uh, certainly your airspeed indicator, your um, barometric pressure is taken from this port. And this is why we typically have a static, an alternate static port too. So you're checking that to make sure it's clear, make sure they didn't paint over it, make sure there's an actual hole there and um, things like that. The ground sockets here. And then you can see, you know, they're talking about the hydraulic reservoir fluid. All right. And that, that's an important part too. All right. So let's move on here. I want to go to step number two. We won't, We don't want this to become a three hour session here in YouTube. It's going to be long enough as it is with its demonstrations to go with it. So here, number two in learning a new airplane is to learn the vital speeds, the V speeds. Now, V doesn't stand for vital. All right. You guys can say it in comments what V stands for, where this came from, the original word V speeds. But the point is, these are the important speeds that you'll see in any POH. Here, we're looking at the four most important for now, um, and that is VR, rotate, VY, best rate of climb, which is your typical climb. VX, best angle if you're going over a 50-foot obstacle or trees at the end of the runway kind of thing. Cruise settings for the majority of your flight. And then your approach and landing. So I put those in there. I don't want to cloud you with a million statistics here in this video. We want to get a handle on the four main phases of flight and the instruments we have to look at for that. Now, keep in mind that all speeds are in miles per hour. So is the airspeed indicator, as you can see right here. The airspeed indicator right here uh, behind me, right behind my head, conveniently. <laughs> wasn't planned that way, but the airspeed indicator, you can see it has the standard markings on it, which is great. This is a great visual right away. And you'll notice that most of these instruments in the Beaver were designed to be able to glance at them. And you know what they are, glance at them. And that's why they still use analog needles in a lot of these types of things, even in cars there is still a needle. You can glance at your dashboard and you not have to worry about, uh, I, can't, I got to interpret this digital number. Is it good? Is it bad? Now, certainly they can make digital numbers green or red or yellow or all of those, but look how easy this is. In the green area is a normal operating range. The white area is your flap range. This means you cannot, re, you cannot deploy flaps. You cannot drop your flaps when you're above 105 knots. All right, and so many of you in the sim will do this. You, you use them to slow down. They're not made to slow down. Flaps are made to give you a better visibility and flaps are made to keep you at a lower stall speed. All right, and so the lower stall speed, I'm actually surprised to see. I think the lower stall speed with flaps is 45. 
and I think that's right around here. So I'm surprised to see that their airspeed indicator doesn't show the flap range lower than your normal operating range. Should be down about here. All right, so, and then you can see the uh, yellow caution area. You can still do that in straight and level and calm air, and then never exceed at 180. So you can see in here, approach and landing 90 miles per hour as you approach through there, as you're applying flaps and you've got your landing flaps in, you should be around 80 miles per hour as you're touching down. And in here, I put in the extra caution that came from the POH, empty the rear tank first to move the center of gravity progressively forward. That's what they do in these. Step three, we don't have twin engines. We're going to step over, jump over that. This is a single engine. So number four, get or make a checklist. All right, now the whole idea behind it, you can find checklists all over the place. Most flying schools, uh, sorry, most flying clubs will share their checklists for whatever airplane they have at their club, and people can find them on the web. I always send a note to the source and say, I'd like to use your checklist or I'd like to use your POH um, in my Twitch sessions or in my YouTube videos, and I get permission, written permission by email. In this case, I made my own checklist out of the PO, this POH. I looked at this POH and I made my checklist. You can certainly do the same. In Twitch, we would just type in exclamation point checklist, but I'll make a link below for you to go and just click on it and it'll pull it out, uh, the checklist that I made. And the checklist that I made looks like this. And we'll be referencing this as I do some of the demonstration flights. It's just a one pager of every area. It was really hard to condense these things down to one page, but it gives you the basics that you need, even the, the run up warm up. And then a picture of the cockpit. You know, that's what I typically do in these, uh, in these uh, checklists that I make. And that's available to you. And then here is the POH that it came from. And when you look back in here, you'll notice it does have sections in here for your steps. And you can see in here, here's a takeoff check. Now there's plenty more in here. This is the real POH. So I had to reduce it down to, you know, the things that we really care about are the things we have to know about here when operating the plane. You can make your own more elaborate checklist from that POH. I print them, I laminate them so they last and they're nearby without using electronic devices. I, I have them on my iPad too, like I do in typical flight. Number four, uh, get or make a checklist. As I mentioned, we should also know the emergency information, although I didn't make a sheet for that. Typically, checklists have normal procedures on one side, emergency procedures on the other, standard V speeds somewhere in a corner, uh, things like that. Here, in this case here, if you're a land plane, just wheels, 95 miles per hour is your, is your glide speed. That gives you what the chart shows you. It gives you the, the most amount of distance for the altitude that you have. If you increase your speed, you're diving too fast, you'll fall shorter of what you expect. If you increase your attitude with nose up, you'll have a slower speed and you can end up stalling out of the sky. It's not beneficial to go slower than this because you won't get the same endurance. All right, you're going way too slow for gliding. All right, even though you can glide slower. So these are the optimum speeds to get the most amount of distance for the height that you have right out of the POH. Seaplane, 92 miles per hour in an engine failure. Land plane, 95. It says for maximum glide distance, keep the flaps up. Absolutely. So many people think that, oh, I'm landing. Even if I'm gliding in an emergency, I'm landing. Let's put flaps on. You can put flaps on once you have the field in sight, once you have the landing zone in front of you and you know you can make the field, certainly you can drop some flaps, maybe on a short final, um, uh, just to get a, a more gentle touchdown. All right, you can certainly do that, but certainly not on the long distance, not in the, the big haul to get to your destination. Keep those flaps up because they'll just induce drag. All right, number five, we'll get through our steps and we'll go and do some demonstrations, you guys. We just have to get familiar with the airplane first, so bear with me. Number five here is learn the blue knob or the blue lever or the propeller lever um, that people will talk about. And you can see it's right here. All right, your propeller lever will control the RPM that you have. Your propeller lever is the actual pitch of the propellers and the governor that goes with it. We did whole a whole Tuesday lesson for two hours on this lever and the variable pitch constant speed propellers. So that's another whole lesson all on its own. How to manage it here in this plane, we simply have to move this lever to match RPM. Typically in cruise 2000, you can see it's in color code up here. And then we will see some, we'll see this in the demonstration. Um, and then we use our throttle as we normally would, but now, use, now the throttle manages your manifold pressure, which is the suction intake of your fuel mixture. 
The mixture knob is still used here, like a progressive mixture knob, full reach forward, lean all the way back and cut off. And we will use that in flight also. As we get into higher altitudes and thinner air, we will actually thin the fuel mixture using our mixture knob. Typical stuff that we do in other planes. So that's the idea. You can see in here right out of your checklist, out of the POH checklist, it talks about flaps to the cruise position, which is actually all the way up. And then throttle back to 29.7 inches of mercury over here. 29.7 is pretty close to where I am right now. And then it says propeller lever to give 2000 RPM or less. 2000 is right here in the middle. In fact, I'm going to show you another screen here. Not sure if it's the next one. Yes, uh, I'm showing you a screen here where they're almost vertical and almost vertical so that when you glance, and they're right here near the windshield, when you glance in cruise, you can see that you're in cruise configuration. Now here is when you get further less and less with your throttle control, your MP drops more and more, you'll see the plane actually descend. All right, you can just drop it back, you know, say to 2000 right here, uh, 25, sorry, right here. You drop it back to 25 using your throttle lever and you'll actually notice that you're descending. Nice cruise descent, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, and then of course, when you're landing, you're gonna make this full like you do with any blue lever mixture full, uh, propeller full, in case you need to do a go around. It's already set to go, right? You can see in here, you know, it's pretty easy. Think of the blue knob like a gear shift. All the way in is like first gear. So all the way in is first gear, and it'll be up here. And then you pull it out as you get to cruise. I'm serious, that's it. And we'll pull it out pr pretty much around the 2000 mark. Um, airplanes today that have a single lever for everything, they're called FADEX systems. They'll manage the RPM and the MP for you. And uh, and then I show you a couple of snippets here, you guys. The CFI once told me that all levers in for takeoff and landing, and then they all come out at, uh, at some point. They all come out to some degree during cruise. So we'll learn these settings for all four phases of flight. Here's an example of what you can set for RPM and manifold pressure depending on the fuel consumption that you wish and the altitude that you're at at the time. All right, and that's actually pretty cool to see that. The first number, of course, is your RPM. Second number is your manifold pressure. And you can see that the RPMs lower at the start, manifold pressure climbs up. And you can see here 26, 26.5, 27.2, 27.5. Anyway, I don't have to go through this. This is in your POH if you're interested in it. Remember, left is for manifold pressure. Center is the what they, we, we've always called the blue lever. Uh, that's for your RPM, which is your, your variable speed uh, propeller. And right is for your mixture. And so the whole idea, you know, is to manage these three while you're doing all phases of flight. And that's what we'll do in the demonstration. Number six is cockpit orientation. Let's get into it. And cockpit orientation is getting to know where everything is. I'm pointing out a few things here. Now, they do have this in the POH. It's a black and white picture that's very complex. If I can just grab that quickly and show it to you at the very start and I'll just scroll down really quickly to uh, you don't see this on screen right now pull it in from another screen like this and section one description of the aircraft should be right around here oh love the diagrams sorry for the scrolling there we go look at that <laughs> so there's some cockpit orientation and to add to that let's point everything out so yeah it's pretty complex there's a lot of stuff in there you certainly should look at this and see how it goes what's this lever under the seat what's that for here's where the actual heat comes through but you know i'm not going to go through this so what i've done is made my own cockpit orientation where i take an actual screen snap of the sim and i take a look at these each individual parts here we see the fuel over here the fuel selector valve off is the default down straight down this is a handle that you grab and turn and it actually moves valves inside that area and those valves go to all three tanks all right the standard three tanks underneath the floor and right now i've got it set for the center tank but it can go to the rear tank and it can go to the front tank once i'm established in cruise i'll put it on the rear tank and drain that first and move that center gravity forward as you can see from other things, I'll get a close-up view of, this, of the switches area. I'll get a close-up view of the circuit breakers area. Uh, I'll get a close-up view of each of these areas. So, so, so bear with me while we have a look at these. But the engine stuff in the middle, the, the, everything from the, the levers, the main two instruments that we watch all the time, 
temperatures and pressures down here. Some of the avionics are here because it doesn't fit anywhere else over here, and it's accessible by both. And down here is your fuel control and heat control, and we'll go look at that in greater detail. Here's your oil filler cap right here. So let's go look at some of these in more detail. You can change your views by using the control key and the number keys. Even if you're on an Xbox, put a keyboard on your Xbox, everybody, and you'll have a lot more versatility for managing stuff instead of trying to figure out how to do that on a controller or if you have extra hardware. But here you see some of the different views that you can get just by using the control key plus a number key. All right, the first one I want to show you, of course, is the standard look, the standard screen, the most important stuff in front of our face while we're flying looking out the window. And you can see this from the left seat, of course, and you can see this as the flaps indicator. Now, this is done with that lever down beside the seat with your right hand. All right, that's, what that, that's how that's done. Here we have the convenience of our flap switch will work if we have hardware with a flap switch. All right. And you can see here I'm in the landing configuration or close to the landing configuration and uh, flaps are down away we go. These are the two most important warnings you want to see. Fuel pressure and oil pressure warnings. If those lights come on, you investigate immediately so they're right up front so we are immediately notified. The standard six pack that you see right here, we won't get into all of those. Obviously they are vacuum driven for this, your, hor your artificial horizon. And for this, your uh, heading indicator, certainly those are vacuum driven. And here's our vacuum gauge right here. It says suction on it, like a lot of them do. And it has to be between the two red ticks on here, which is um, uh, 4.5 to 5.5. That's what you're looking for in your cruise checks, your downwind checks, or your first startup checks. You're looking for that. Your clock, of course, for timing and stuff like that. And your normal six pack stuff your altitude where you have to adjust for your barometric pressure to start with and away you go. Uh, I've added the option from the tablet for two VORs in here but uh, there is a standard uh, configuration there. So you know the things you need to glance at my flaps are there. The only thing I don't see here is like a gear indicator but it's a fixed gear airplane. It's only a gear indicator when you're flying floats or amphibious floats I should say and then you need a gear indicator because that's such an important part gear up for water, gear down for land, right? That would be nice to have that right here also, but it's only in the amphibious version. The very top of the screen are trims that you could reach up and trim. We can do this with our, our typical uh, Bravo throttle quadrant trim or our tr um, velocity one trim. Those things can all do this also. Outside air temperature right here, up on the ceiling also. And lots of padding, what's that for? <laughs> Next, we move down into the below six pack. All right, so we looked at the six pack up here. Just below that is your switch panel. We see a lot of the switches here. There's a few more over to the right, but here are your standard strobe, landing light, all of those, beacon light, you name it. Here we also have the starter for the electric starter, although these planes can also be hand cranked. In the coldest of weather, I've actually seen make sure the magneto's off, of course, and we've seen the pilot get out onto the float and turn the prop three turns and he says that puts oil into the cylinders he's done this before he retired the night before and in the next morning to make sure there's some oil on the cylinders before he actually starts it isn't that amazing right the things you learn from the real pilots right um, we also have a fuel boost here so it's interesting we do have a wobble pump which i'm going to use for startup the normal way that i've seen them do but i'm surprised to see a fuel boost here once the engine's running, it supplies the five PSI's that you need, but you can do the wobble pump to start it off. But if you don't want to click on the wobble pump four times, you could go over here and use this electric one. I presume it was an option on some of them. Interestingly enough, you guys, here's our fuel selector in the off position. Um, here is the water rudders. You obviously, I'm in an amphib right now. The water rudders. It's this chrome handle that you grab and slide up or down. And that actually puts the water rudders behind the floats down into the water or back up again. You can do this with Control W in this sim. In any float plane that has water rudders, you can do Control W. But it's just better to go and click it, you know, or map something to it. Anyway, kind of cool. Uh, the masters here, certainly master and alt are here. And when you turn off that alt switch, you'll see the alt light go on 
over on the right. We'll point that out in a minute. Once things are rolling during your checklist, then you turn on the avionics. One of the reasons avionics is a separate switch is so that you don't surge the avionics electronics with power. When you first start the engine, the regulator can't manage it properly. Let that engine settle and then turn on avionics. And then you've got a constant regulated DC supply going in there. All right. Now we'll go take a look. We'll just go from left to right across the bottom here. Here's the lower main. And then above it is the upper main. So this actually right part of the screen is actually above this left part of the screen. All right. So let's do that. Let's just go left to right. Over here, you can see cabin heat. You just pull that or push it. And the reason it's such a strange, can, you know, strange vertical configuration here, it actually controls the airflow of the... Um, there's a shroud around the exhaust, just like in a lot of cars too, for carburetor heat or for recycling some heat from the exhaust back into the carburetor. Here, it, it's a, a, um, a covering over top of the exhaust pipe that gets warm, but it actually will vent that into the lower vents that you see on the floor. All right, and you'll see those vents when we go take a look at other views and the heat will come up from there. Let me tell you, in the cold of winter in the Canadian North, in Northern Ontario and in, in the uh, BC interior where I've been in the middle of winter in a beaver, this, you can't get this heat on fast enough, you know, because it's cold. You're dressed for it. You get in there, you're doing your walk around with gloves on, of course, and, and uh, all kinds of even had a ski mask on at one point. So there's your, car, your ca uh, cabin heat once it, the engine warms up because it relies on the engine heat, just like in a lot of cars. Here's your carburetor heat over here, this lever here. And right now it's in the cold position where it should be. You can use carburetor heat when, just like typical airplanes, you guys, when you see a degradation of the engine and you know your settings are correct, you're doing it according to the POH, but you're running rough, your performance is degrading, what's going on with my engine? You could have carburetor ice. A lot of you aren't used to this because you're flying fuel-injected airplanes where you don't worry about carb ice or carb heat. <clears throat> but these older planes, and certainly a lot of the older Cessna 172s that I fly, Carb heat is important. It's part of our checklists. Now, carb heat, when you put it on, what it does is heat up the throat of the carburetor and it melts any ice that's in there. This is important, but you'll notice as you do this, if this is realistically simulated in, in here, you'll notice that just like in real life, the engine will run even rougher for a few minutes or a few seconds because you've melted the ice and now the airplane is ingesting that water with the fuel. <laughs> so keep that in mind when you put on carburetor heat it could be rougher for a few seconds and then wow it's working beautifully now and that's when you know that you actually had carb ice and you'd have carb ice in conditions you don't even realize the temperature ranges so i leave it on cold for normal starts and normal operation i'll put it on hot when um, the engine certainly warmed up and when i'm in flight and i feel a degradation the wobble pump itself you click it to go up you click it to go down and each pump gives us some pressure they recommend four so two up two down and that'll get us rolling you'll i'll show you the instrument that we'll look at um matter of fact i'll show you the instrument right now <laughs> it's right in front of my face right here on the upper panel so while you're pumping this you look up to this gauge right here the fuel pressure gauge and this needle will be straight across that's your five. Now, if you do the wobble pump and then sit and look at this thing, you'll see it start to slowly fall. And then you get it a wobble pump again. You'll see it slowly fall. So once you've pumped it up, you don't do this wobble pump until you're ready to turn the key. All right. When I'm ready to turn the key, I'll wobble it to five and then I'll turn the key. I've got enough pressure on my fuel to deliver the fuel. Once the engine's running, you'll see it stay consistently at that five with its engine driven fuel pump, like a lot of cars today, right? So that, then you can see, and you notice that they've designed this thing so that a lot of things are normal temperatures in the middle, normal pressures on the horizontal. And same with here, here's your oil PSI, right? It's gonna be above the horizontal. You can glance and see that it's where it's supposed to be. Over here, you also notice your fuel gauges of all three tanks, all right, and how much fuel you have left your oil temperature, which is important also, and your fuel mixture temperature, and I'm, I'm good. Below that, some avionics, we can talk about that later, but this is your, your standard CAP 140. Um, this is something we have in the WB Sim Realistic. It works great. 
Um, here you see your transponder with all its digits, standard transponder you'll see, and down here we see an ADF. Uh, here's the oil filler, by the way. If you click it, it'll spin. And if it's loose, if you've, if you've clicked it and it's loose and it's not completely turned in, they'll be rattling when you take off. I'm serious. This one here is an emergency fuel shutoff. All right, right now it's open, meaning letting fuel flow. In the up position, it's closed, meaning that's only used in the case of an emergency landing where you need to shut off everything. And typically in an engine out scenario, after a typical engine restart, doesn't work, no, 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 doesn't work, doesn't work. Okay, now the next step in the POH is shut down anything to do with the engine. All right, and that would be when you would reach to this lever and you would close the fuel. All right, so that's in the standard position that stays there for most of the time. There is this beautiful tablet, and in the tablet you can change some options. Now, I happen to be in a wheel plane right now, so I have the ability to put chocks on and tie downs. Rudder lock, attach skis. Now this is the 40th anniversary enhancement. Allows me to attach skis, secure and cover. Um, and then close and open the doors from here. Now you can just click on the handle of the door and it'll open, but it swings way open flat. So it's easy accessibility. And how do you go out there and click the handle again? You can't. So it gives us this nice convenient toggle the doors back closed again, beautiful. This is the optional stack other than the 530-430 that I've added in just by clicking here, analog radios. Beautiful. And here you can see the options here. Here I've switched it over to the 530-430 and here I've switched it back to the standard Bendix King stuff that I see in a lot of the old planes that I work with. And there's the audio panel up top. All right, uh, cockpit orientation, lower right electrical. So underneath that navigation 530-430, you can see here, there's your alternator light. If you turn off your alternator switch, standard check during run up, you'll see this light come on. You'll see the amps drop. You'll see the voltage drop. You're not charging your battery and it's a dangerous situation. If that light comes on in flight, you'll want to recycle your, your power. And if that's not working, you want to put this airplane down fast. Now, magnetos will always work even if your battery's dead, but nothing else would work, of course. Uh, your magnetos would work, your hydraulics would still work because they are driven by the uh, by the engine. But a lot of the, you know, all the rest of the stuff won't work at all. Your normal uh, lights here, instrument lights and cabin light. Cabin lights like little floodlights, there's some up in the corners and, uh, you know, it gives you a nice glow inside the cabin. Your normal circuit breaker resets are over here, although I don't know if they're usable or, uh, yeah, I'm spoiled now by WB Sim because I... Keep your battery fully charged and in a warm place before flight. Yep, fully charged and full of water. Yep, absolutely. And here's your normal flying view in the cockpit orientation so that you can see your gauges for flying. You can see your standard six pack and manage your levers. Don't forget your heading indicator is a gyro instrument. It has to be checked against the compass every 15 minutes in level flight to make sure. Read the compass that's already settled in level flight and make sure it says the same thing over here. Pretty cool. In a float plane, you see a canoe option and an anchor option. Look at that on the tablet. Is that cool or what? That is so cool. I love it. All right, take it for a spin and get to the practice area at altitude. So practice stalls, slow flight, turns and level and get comfortable with the airplane. Uh, head back to the airport for your first landing and your go around practice and do circuits again and again. And that's your typical step number seven in whatever plane you're in at the time. All right, so in this case here, the POH, I just wanna point out a couple more things and then we'll talk about, uh, we'll go and do some demonstrations, you guys. So right now, um, what I'll do is I'm gonna go take a look right now and just see I think at this point, I'll probably do a demonstration on wheels first, um, then do a demonstration on skis second, and then do uh, the final demonstration will be on uh, amphibious, which is my favorite. The last one, right, is amphibious. All right, so you can see in here, it says the POH has diagrams and information relating to each airplane. I wanted to show you this picture from the POH of skis. And they have their trim unit, they have their suspension, their springs, their little uh, shock absorber, and they do have wires here that are used to either they're fixed wires that hold it at the right angle so it doesn't dig into the snow or they are um, um, retractable. They can pull 
the skis up more into the wheel so that the wheels are exposed or back down so that more of the ski is exposed. In here they look like static from what I can tell and in the sim they're static too. So you can't bring them up or lower them as you can in some planes. Looks like they're attached here static, you know, that you can't move them. So that's good. It keeps the right angle. Make sure you don't dig in. Let's start our ski demonstration by putting the skis on. So you start with your conventional wheeled airplane. And if you have the 40th anniversary enhancement, not the 40th anniversary update, but the enhancement, which you can get on flysim.to, you can add skis to the conventional wheels. Let's go back in the plane now and we'll just go over and see how to do that. If you come over here to the tablet, get a closer view of that, then you'll notice you have the option here to put chocks, skis, tie downs, all the rest. And we're going to put some skis on it. They're as simple as that. Come back outside the plane. Let me just reset that view. And you can see now that we do have skis on the plane. Let me get a better view here with the camera. And you can see when we get in real close here how the skis look and the kind of detail that we're looking at here. Fixed, no extra, no extra pistons or shocks like you saw in the POH, but they do work. All right, and you can see that the wheels do poke down a little bit. They're not, they're not retractable. Some some ski gear on some aircraft have wires, as I mentioned earlier. They have wires that are connected to the skis, and you actually pull the ski up. Which, which shows more of the wheel. So the wheels don't actually lower or raise. The skis actually raise to expose more wheel or the skis come back down, usually spring loaded to, uh, to, so that you don't have a wheel. And you know, this one here is just fixed. So there is some wheel showing in the snow that wouldn't bother us at all. The skis will take the load across the whole length of the ski. That's what it's all about. Now let's just change the weather so that we've got ourselves some snow and what we can do is just simply go into live weather and I'm sure here where we are it's going to put snow on the ground. Here, See after I say that <laughs> and there it is okay had to wait for it. Now this is more like what we're after alright this is ski country no doubt about it. This is an actual airport this is actually Hope Airport in British Columbia where I've flown out a lot of times. Alright back into the plane let's get rolling now treat it just like any other any other tail dragger only now we uh, we don't really know where the runway is. As a matter of fact, you guys, with this kind of weather here, with this kind of weather, I don't think I'm flying. So uh, I wouldn't be able to find the field again to come back down. So I'm just going to lighten that up a bit. Take away the live weather and just throw some snow in there like that. And at least then I can still find the field. <laughs> there still isn't a strip of any sort. I mean, once there's snow on the ground and it's not plowed, we're in trouble. But that'll work. All right, we'll just see where we are. Yeah, that'll work. Sure, we can we can at least find the flat spot and get going. All right, back into the plane. Let's get rolling. We're gonna just check that the uh, give it a bit of power. Make sure it's still you know there's where it should be idling really. On a tail dragger, we got to be careful with brakes on, and revving it up to do our, our run up. Uh, you could actually nose over, but let's just see now. I'm gonna press the uh, parking brake. I got some movement okay and we're just going to give it some power I've got 20 degrees of flaps all the way up hold back the tail wheel have a look at that on the ground let it level up like that tail wheels off the ground and then we get airborne and away we go like any other tail wheel so really it's just tail wheel flying everybody it's just tail wheel flying let me just come back around and land simple as that I'm just going to pull back some power now. I'm not going to climb too much higher. Gorgeous area. I'm going to stay pretty low here. Come back down and just do a, you know, a low level circuit. Come back in. Hey, someone came along with me. That's great. Look at this gorgeous area. This time of year, ski country. All right, that'll work somewhere around there. Beautiful. I mean, look how close we are. It's gorgeous. And there's where we're going to land, somewhere down there. Not really sure until I line up. But, uh, you know, close to the buildings, it's got to be some kind of airstrip down that way. Sure. 
come back around. Hey, we could do the amphibious part here too. It would be one cold river, but we'll do it anyway. Nice. Let's just head around now. I'm going to just drop some power. We should be slow enough. Yep, we're in the flap range if you look down here at the airspeed indicator. Dropping my first flap. Actually, I, I already was, I, I never did retract the flaps. So we are just three notches away from getting into landing configuration. You can see the speed decay there. Let's just let her drop a bit. Full forward on the propeller, just in case we have to do a go around. And let's go over that away. It looks like I can see pretty much the landing strip there. Let's make sure we don't decay too much here as we come around. Certainly you can stall on a turn and we'll get lined up and come in for a landing somewhere around there. Yeah, right there. There it is. Nothing to it. Let's go in there, just over the trees. I'm going to pull it back some more now. Looking good. You can see by my speed there, I'm still way above stall speed, which is fine. Then I'll see if I can pull it out into a, an outside view as we touch down, making sure we don't touch the trees. And maybe I can get us zoomed in a little here. And then when we do the outside view, let's see if I can pull this off from the outside of the plane, you guys. Like that. Flare. I'm gonna try it. It's hard to do on snow, just like it is hard to do on water. And then I should be touching right about now. Not bad from the outside view. I would be a lot smoother from inside the plane, you guys. <laughs> but I wanted to see, I wanted to let you see that as we did the touchdown. And skis, you know, no different than working with, with wheels, except you'd have to think about is there ice on the runway? I mean, the real practical part of this, is there ice on the runway? Is there, uh, are these conditions that I can land in? Am I at the right place? Uh, like any tail dragger, don't hit the brakes too hard. <laughs> I'm touching them. <laughs> Uh, so I also want to mention one last thing about this uh, view. Let me just come down here. This tail wheel at the back here, this tail wheel only has a 29 degree left and right. I think I mentioned it in the presentation. After 29 degrees in the real beaver, after 29 degrees, it'll go into full castering mode like that. And full castering mode, it, it shouldn't be turning right now. It shouldn't have gone 90 degrees like that. But it would, after in the real plane, after 29 degrees, it becomes a full castering, and you would use differential braking to help with that. All right, that's the ski demo, but really it's no different than a wheel demo in a tailwheel aircraft. Beautiful. Look over here, uh, amphibious mooring to a buoy like this, um, mooring to a jetty or move, mooring to a, a dock of some sort or beaching with gear fitted, and you put this extra gear down below. Um, <clears throat> Good to know because, you know, when you're, the whole idea here about mooring to a buoy, if you were to start this airplane right now, you would cut these ropes and probably prop strike on the on the buoy itself as you move forward. So they'll typically, and I've seen this happen, um, they'll typically push it forward with their paddle and unhook it and then drift a bit while they start the engine. They'll do that. They won't leave it connected, but they want to get that blade ahead of that buoy because once you start it, you'll keep going further ahead. Little things like that you learn when you're actually in the real thing. And then here, this is a float only without wheels. They've added the wheels on. This is your beaching gear fitted. So they don't normally have wheels. All right. That's not an amphib. That's just a float plane. All right. So I want to mention here to finish off, um, before I show you some more demonstrations, the rest of, the, of this presentation will be demonstrations and then a closing at the end. But I just want to mention in here, I, I did some research. This is as of, I don't know what the date is today, but the end of November. I found these two in a long list of, you know, a for sale site for beavers. Every single beaver was sold, 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 all the way down the list. And only these two were the only two left that weren't sold on the list as of yesterday. And um, the one on the left here, both of these are in Canada, Northwest Flying Inc. in Nestor Falls, Ontario here in this province. And the right one is from uh, British Columbia. And uh, you can see both of these, look at the price of this one. These are used, you guys, but they would have overhauls, they would have extra options, all the rest of it. 240,000 US for this one, and uh, 450,000 for this one. That's how much they cost to own one of these babies. 
And so uh, I'll still just visit docks and ask if they want, if they need someone to come along for the ride or an extra pilot with some extra eyeballs or whatever else, whatever it takes to talk myself onto that airplane. <laughs> All right, so that's what they're worth, you guys. So from this point on, let me go do some more demonstrations. I'll come back here to finish up. I'll come back here to um, to um, just do a summary on it, okay? Look at these cabin doors. Look, Sorry, look at these cargo doors open. They actually open that wide so you can get drums in and whatever. And uh, that's another floor vent that brings in heat. Uh, wide enough to bring, and this is one of their criteria, wide enough to bring a, an oil drum into here you know and you can take two of them in this plane uh so you know in and out for cargo on either side beautiful and nice big doors everywhere love it let's go demonstrate uh, a few more now let's go through the checklists get this thing rolling i'm going to use the checklist that i made for the sessions this is available to you in the links below. Use this checklist in your home flight simulator only, of course. This is very abbreviated. I wanted to make it into a one-pager, and that's it, and then a, a picture of the actual panel. Uh, so that's all there is here. There isn't even an emergency card. There's just this, and, and all of this was taken from the POH. All right, so the very simple thing here, flight control locks free and correct, all engine levers back. So let's do two at a time, flight controls, free and correct there's the elevator at the back you can see that there is the ailerons which you can't really see well here you can see the balancers moving uh, let's just move it around this way and then you can see those moving just fine all right then we'll also do the rudder pedals and the rudder pedals you can see over here are moving that they're also moving the water rudders free and correct we're good there's the trim tab for rudder and there's also a trim tab uh, a trim surface here on both sides of the wing for elevator trim which is one of the most important ones so controls are free and correct now from inside the plane you would look left and if you could see that eh, it's not quite visible let's just do it like this maybe a little more you'd have to really get down there maybe i can do this hold on there we go so as you look out that window and you turn the yoke to the left you should see that aileron move right there and it should be up. So a good expression here is when you're turning toward an aileron, point your thumb up. Then you know that they're tied in properly. Again, if I look from the outside, I'm looking at the left aileron, it's going up. It's going up. All right, looking at the right aileron and I'm turning the yoke to the right, it should go up. All right, that's the idea. And typically in a, in a controls check, you go one, two, while you're watching this. And then you go three, four, as you're watching this. All right, and then it's five, six, seven, eight. And that's how you do a quick check. And you can do that all very quickly, of course. So controls are free and correct. We're good. I already did the walk around and took down all the tight ons. And the second one on the list was all controls back towards you. All right, and that's what we've got going right there. The third one on the checklist is all switches off. Let's just go over here. <clears throat> all levers back, pull back toward the back of the airplane. Fuel quantity, select the fullest tank, all switches off, battery on. All right, so select the fullest tank, or in this case, as you can see, my tanks are, well, we can't tell the, till the power's on. But the, we're going to use the we're going to use the rear tank first to move that center of gravity forward. That's what you typically do here in the Beaver. All right. Now when we turn our master on like this, we can see we've got quantities here. Um, the fullest tank would probably be the middle one. We're going to use up that rear tank first while we're doing run up and take off, and then we're going to move forward after a few minutes to one of the other tanks. Okay, so we've got all those checks done. Let's just reset that back to a normal screen. And we see power is on, we're getting ready to start. Next thing is propeller area clear, fuel and oil, emergency cutoff levers open. All right, so let's go look and see what that is. I'm going slowly through this the first time, why not? And so if you use one of the views, let's try this one, maybe that one. And you can see in here, this is your emergency cutoff. Well, there's a pop-up that tells you that. This lever here is your emergency cutoff. That's good if you have an engine out or an engine fire and you want to 
you know, standard checklist procedure is to cut all fuel. Here is a wobble pump. All right, this is actually just carburetor heat. This is cabin heat. Oh, good, I've got the pop-ups on. So the wobble pump is what you would use to pump up the pressure, the fuel pressure, to 5 PSI. All right, and when you look over here at the fuel pressure gauge, you want it to be horizontal. Right now it's straight down at zero. So you're going to pump it up to 5, and if you leave it, it'll fall. So you want to pump it up to 5 and then start the engine. All right, that's what we're going to do, give you an idea of what's going to happen there. So propeller air clear, fuel emergency cutoff levers are open. Open meaning let it flow. Mixture lever, full forward rich, throttle lever quarter to half inch open. All right, so mixture and throttle, which is typical on many planes. Where we come up to here, there's mixture all the way forward, um, propeller all the way forward, and throttle quarter to half inch prop. When we're starting this up, we're going to settle in around 1,000 to keep things, the generator moving and uh, power going. All right, we're ready to start. We take a look at this. The propeller area is clear. There's nobody in this remote area where I am. Wobble pump action to 5 PSI. Prime four strokes. We don't have a primer to work with. So we're just going to use wobble pump to 5 PSI. Both ignition switches on, starter, and then 500 to 800. So this sequence has to happen pretty quickly because once you wobble pump it, you've got to catch it while it's still up there. Once the engine starts, it'll stay at 5 PSI or above. All right, so we're going to wobble it, start it, 500 to 800, and look at our oil pressure right away. All right, this is important in all airplanes. We've got to make sure that's working or shut it down. All right, now at this point, they do actually put the propeller lever forward. All right, so I'm going to just follow. At this point down here, the propeller lever goes full forward, not before. So I'm going to change that now. So I'm going to take my propeller lever back to here and just do that after it starts. Okay, ready to start. So we're going to go down to the wobble pump right here. I'm going to do it this way so you can see what's happening up here. I'm going to go like this. So wobble one. Oh, this is the one you have to... Let me remove the yoke here. This is the one you have to click it both ways. You can see it's already getting up there toward 5, but it's sinking. And I'll go in real close just to show you that, like this. You can see it's starting to fall from 5. I want you to see that anyway. And, it, you know, it eventually does fall. So then you want to pump it back up. And then when it's between these two red tick marks, you want to start the engine. All right, we've already got power on, and so we want to do that. So I'll just come back down here. Might be able to do it like this. One, two. There it is. It's already up to five. All right, prop clear. Immediately look at your oil pressure. We're good. Temperature is going to rise. We're good. And we want to take it to 800 to uh, 500 to 800 RPM. Let's just come up here. And we are already moving because there was no parking brake set. All right. All right, so here we are at 1,000. Uh, let's see. Sorry, that's manifold right here. So five, six, seven, eight. We're good. That's where we want to be. I, I just knew that was the setting for the, uh, for the throttle. And this will climb as we increase throttle during our run-up. So let's just check on that now. We're going to be doing the run-up. Propeller lever full forward. Now we put it full forward after the start. All right. So let's just go back to here. Propeller lever full forward. We've got our 50 PSI on the oil. Ensure the engine oil between 100 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this is one of those airplanes you take your time warming up. So don't worry about fast and get things moving because it has to get up into the right range. So we want to make sure that the engine oil is between 100 to 200 Fahrenheit. All right, now, which one is the engine oil? Remember the cockpit orientation? Again, these are our engine instruments right here. Let's just have a look at this. And this is oil and fuel pressure. And here we see temperature in Celsius right here. What is this temperature right here? All right, this one here is 0, 10, and 20. What is this one here? This says cylinder temperature. All right, so we're looking at this, and we're looking to increase it between... Um, uh, between, um, let me see, I forgot, 100 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. 
that's Fahrenheit. Wow. So 100 to 200 Fahrenheit. <laughs> and we're working with machines that are in both, like it's got a miles per hour and it's got, uh, airspeed is in miles per hour. Yeah, airspeed is in miles per hour and we've got temperature being read in Celsius. Okay then, metric on the temperature and and, uh, and not on the uh, airspeed. All right, so we've got those in place, we're good. Uh, RPM to 2100. First thing, uh, sorry, let's go to the checklist, you guys. I've got it off screen here. Propeller lever full, got it. Uh, we're going to now throttle to 1750. The aircraft is into wind, parking brakes on. We're going to now move throttle to 1750. Propeller lever's full already. And set 600 RPM. Ignition off and on. Oh, we're going to do that afterwards. So 750. And we're going to do our test. All right. It doesn't actually say it here. I've got to change this, but sorry, everybody. But throttle to 1750 and we'll do our, our magneto test. I don't see it here anyway. It's part of the run up. All right. Let's go back to here. And we're going to do our run up. So there's our RPMs right there. I'm going to just move over here. What I'm going to do just to give you an idea how this works there is your magnetos. Give you an idea. There's left. We'll go back to both. There's right, we'll go back to both. So that's what I'm going to be doing to test, but we got to do this up at uh, up to speed with our RPM. So we'll come over here so we can see our RPM gauge, so we can see the drop. Let's get right in there. There's our RPM gauge. We're taking it up to 1750, here we go. I'm just using the normal throttle lever, as you can see, it's going up to 1750 on the RPM, right about there. 16, 17, right about there. All right, we're not worried about the manifold pressure, we're just worried about the RPMs. Now, over to left, we're going to see if it drops. Yep, about 50. We were at 1750, it dropped to about 17. Back to both so we don't have any fouling, it actually clears up the plugs. Now we're going to go to just the right magneto, and it dropped about 50 also, which is perfectly fine, as long as it doesn't drop within 150 between them back to both let that settle for a bit clear the plugs make sure they're all firing again and now we take it back to 600 rpm well it's really idle is what you're testing so i take it right back to idle that should be around 600 settling in 550 yeah and what you're doing is making sure that it doesn't stall and making sure the engine doesn't stall i should say because we do have a different kind of stall in an airplane but you're making sure the engine doesn't quit all right down at idle which could happen now that we've got it at 600, one of the tests we do is to turn the magnetos off completely and back on. And you're checking to see if there's a short in the magneto system. All right, so I'm just going to go all the way to off for a split second and back on. And when I did that, it killed the propeller completely. It actually killed it all. I went off too, too long, I guess. Yep, I guess it was off too long. It's supposed to be momentarily. And and really it will, you'll hear the engine stop for a split second and come back on and the magnetos keep everything rolling again. So that's a typical check that you would normally do. All right, 1600 for taxi. So we'd come up to here. There's our normal taxi right around there. No faster than that. All right, now I'm near the water. I can just slip right into the water, right? And uh, you'll see that as we get going. All right. So let's just go back and see where we are. We finished the uh, the engine start, before start, engine start, and run up. Throttle to 1600 to taxi. Um, oh, RPM to 2100. So even after our 1750 and after our end ignition off test, go back up to 2100. It's even higher. Make sure oil, fuel, and vacuum pressures. So let's check that out. Always got to check vacuum too, because some of the instruments are running on vacuum. And so now we'll take it to 21. Brakes are on. 21 should be somewhere around there. Let's see if I'm right. Uh, 18, 21. Right around there. I'm actually moving at 21, so I'm gonna pull it back a bit. There we go. The brakes aren't working well. All right, so we wanna go and check our vacuum. All right, where's our vacuum? Let's go have a look, you guys. Here's our suction right here. It should be around five. It's between 4.5 and 5.5. I bet you if I were at 2100, you'd see it right in the middle. All right, so we're good with the suction. 
We also want to look at temperatures. You can see temperatures are now rising into the acceptable range here between 40 and 80. Remember that's in Celsius everybody. 40 Celsius is definitely over 100. We are supposed to be between 100 and 200. So we're good. All right. We can also see that our fuel pressure is at 5. I mean everything we're checking here is all within range. Here's our oil pressure between 50 and 100 which is supposed to be right here. So we've got everything going for us. This plane is ready to rock and roll. I've got it set for the rear fuel tank. It has a little less than the others, but you're supposed to set for the fullest tank. I'm gonna turn my avionics on at this point. It's not on the checklist, I don't think, but that's a normal thing you do before you taxi, of course. Now that everything else is running properly, I'm gonna bring this back to a normal idle before we get rolling. Again, I'll just take it right down to nothing. It should sit somewhere around the 600 mark maybe there all right flaps at takeoff propeller full that's our next step taxi and climb out flaps at takeoff propeller full higher rpm for cooling while taxiing so we're going to go to 1600 keeps the air moving in the plane or in the engine the engine is an air cooled engine carb heat cold pitot heat if needed depends on your temperature outside and then rotate at 55 to 65 all right depends on the weight of the aircraft so carb heat cold flaps at takeoff let's do that so our carb heat lever, let's come back to maybe uh, a default view. Control one, two, two, three, four. All right, there we go. There's our carb heat right there. Carburetor heat, it's set for cold right now. Typically you don't use it to set to hot until you're in the air. Typically your cold is your filtered air and your hot is your unfiltered. But anyway, we'll do what the POH says. It's on cold on this lever. Parking brake is still set cabin heat it's looking pretty cold outside that's optional of course and uh, making sure that our filler cap is all the way in or it'll rattle good it's a quick check that I should put that in the actual checklist everything's ready to go we also said that we would do um, pedo heat if needed and we don't really need that right now it's a good check matter of fact during during our normal walk around we lower the flaps we turn on the master lower the flaps and turn on the pitot heat and we and then turn it off after a while and we go out and we actually see if it's warm with our hand that's typically how we do it um, but anyway uh, we'll turn that on and we'll get rolling that'll help us with our airspeed indicator etc all right flaps to uh, sorry flaps to the last thing here was flaps to takeoff which is right up here and I'm just going to do the flaps it's a pump on the floor pump 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 there's a first degree of flap and here, here's our takeoff. So the, the, you know, it, it is actually um, this is actually your climb setting. This is your takeoff. So once we get positive rate off the ground, uh, no more usable runway, and then we'll now set it for a climb. All right. And here's our landing. And here's the rarely used full flap if you really had to an emergency or get into a small lake or whatever. You're not normally using full flap. You notice way back here at zero flaps, it actually says cruise. But you know, you saw that when we did the presentation. All right, let's see what we need to do now, just because things are gonna move quickly now. As we climb, we're gonna rotate at 55 to 65, climb and accelerate to 95, and then we're gonna set flaps to climb 30 MP, 2000 RPM. 30 MP, 2000 RPM. So 30 is straight up, it's a red bar right there, and 2000 RPM is straight up. So normal, is going to be straight up and straight up on the needles. Look at that, look how easy that'll be. And of course we'll bring the flaps back so we can increase some speed there. All right, that's the plan. Rotate 55 to 65. Back into the plane. First I'm going to taxi into the water. I'll just have a quick look here, I can go out that way. I could probably go out that way. Definitely go out that way for sure. Yep, and probably behind me, yeah. We are in beautiful British Columbia, you guys. All right, I'll set the taxi. I've got my taxi clearance, if there happened to be anyone on the radio in this remote area. And now I'm going to release the parking brake, which is down here at the bottom. You remember seeing that? It's right here. Release the parking brake. And then now away we go. 1600 RPM max for taxiing. It also gives us, uh, it also gives us some um, cooling for the engine, right? Here we go into the water gently I 
I got it up to about 1700, 1600 to taxi into the water. Once I'm deep enough, I'll put the uh, water rudders down. That should be deep enough. Looks like I'm away from the shore. Just trying to get away from the shore. Yep, we're good. We're moving. Okay, water rudders down just to get in place. Well, I don't have to right now because I'm not going to turn any sharp, sharp any direction, but water rudders down. And you saw that demonstration already. There the water rudders are down. And I'm going to bring them back up again. There we go. We're good. Ready for takeoff. Remember, rotate 55 to 65. Full on the throttle. Keep the stick back or keep the yoke back to make sure it stays in the water. We're going to rotate around 55. Whoops, wrong view. There we go. Not there yet. Right there. Right about, there's 40, 55 right there. A little rough when we get this far. And we're off the water. All right. Now, uh, what I didn't mention was while we were in the water, I did a gear up. And I just did it automatically and I should have said it. We have gear up while we were in the water. As soon as I put the water rudders down, the gear came up. All right, I put the gear up. All right, so we did rotate. Now we want to get to 95. We're already there, I think, if I look closely here. Yeah, we're definitely there. It's over 100. And so now we want to set flaps to climb. So we're going to raise them one like that. Now we're on climb. And it's typically a 90 knot climb. So let's do that get the right attitude for that and you can see there is 90 knots right about there I'm going to trim it just using the trim wheel you guys I want to set that 90 right about there and there it is I'm hands-free and that's my climb this plane can do it it can do it I don't necessarily want to go too high so now I'm going to go transition I'm going to go to flaps to zero I'm going to do 30 RPM. Let me see if I can just move over here. Like that. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, 30 on the MP. 2,000 on the propeller RPM. There we go. Now that's normal there. And you can see I'm leveling off. This will be normal cruise. You'll see my speed pick up now. Unless I intended to climb some more. And so now let me, let's just get that attitude right for a normal cruise. And I should get up to about 130 to 140, all right, at this setting. Still climbing. And we can just look at our, our vertical speed indicator just to see what's happening. And as I pick up speed, of course, I have more lift. So let's just do that. I could have leveled off at 2,000. I'm staying pretty much around water because I'm going to land. All right. so. Flaps to cruise, that's what we've done. Throttle to 29.7 on the MP. Oh, not 30, everybody. Not 30. 29.7. Right there. <laughs> I'm actually surprised at that. 29.7 is right there. Okay, can we get a close-up of that? Probably, if I do this. There we go. 29. Uh, yeah, okay. Maybe there. Oh, that's kind of funny. Okay, we could say 30, couldn't we? And my 2000 is still set nicely right there. There's our setting for cruise. Flaps are at cruise setting too. You can see that up here. We are set for a normal flight. There we go. Let's enjoy the countryside. Beautiful. I'm in this nice open area. There's no way that I have a problem landing in this lake or this stream or whatever this is. And I'm going at 130 knots normal cruise. I could inch that up a little. Oh, I can see I'm just, just well, I just turned so I'm descending a little. Um, I could take that up a bit faster. Take it up instead of 29.7. I could put, give it a boost. Temperatures and pressures in the green. Propeller lever gives 2,000 RPM or less. So you're just trying to preserve the engine. Temperature and pressures in the green. I'm looking here. Temperature looks good there. Temperature looks good there. Temperature looks good there. We are good to go. Now that I'm in level cruise, I'm going to switch to my center tank. Now you could, you, oops, I just turned off my fuel. Ah, ah, look at that. You just have to click it and it'll turn it off for you. Okay, then. There we go. Whew. That was close. I think I lost some altitude there. Yeah, a few thousand feet. 
Yeah, be careful with that. Now with your hand you would just turn it, but I just clicked it, yeah. There's an up arrow and a down arrow. So anyway, watch it when you, when you switch your tanks. What happened to my nice big river? I had a nice big, big, there it is. All right, so um, climbing back up a bit, I'm gonna give it a bit of power to do the climb. Give it full RPM, maybe back a little, and I'm giving it full throttle. Just to climb back, but you know, if I'm gonna go land, no worries, all right? All right, back to 30, 29.7, and we're good again. All right, mess that up with the tank. All right, now, approach and landing at 105. Let's have a look at that. It does say empty the rear tank first. I should have left it on there, but I'm gonna land, so I'm on the fullest tank. Right here, I'm gonna land. All right. Right here, let's go back inside where it's a bit quieter. Right here, I'm going to go to temperature pressure in the green propeller. Cruise is good, set trims, I did. Now we're coming down here, approach and landing at 105 flaps to landing. Landing lights on, prop lever to full. You do this so that you're prepared for go around, mixture rich. All right, reduce speed towards 90, gear down or up, and you get into that range. I'm gonna head right to a, looks like I'm heading right for a mountain. Sure, let's go this way. <laughs> head in the cockpit. All right, so what are we aiming for? At 105, we can do flaps, we know that. Landing light on, make sure our levers are full gear down or up, depending on what we're landing on, approach speed is 80, approximately 1,000 feet per minute. So we're looking for approach speed of 80. That's what we're aiming for. All right, let's try that. All right, first thing I want to check is my wheels are up. Go on this side, have a look. Yep, wheels are up. And you could also check the lever to make sure your wheels are up. I'm going to reduce speed now. Reduced speed's gonna get me into the flap range. Now I'm in the flap range. I wasn't that far off. And so now I can start giving flaps. There's our first one. Second one, that's our normal uh, takeoff position. Third, and finally fourth. This is our landing position. Oops, I should actually, it didn't quite get to fourth. All right, fourth. There's our landing position right there. Beautiful. And you can see here we've got um, maybe 80. There's our landing speed. We are right on. And you, you, can, you can tell, you don't want to drop below 60. Obviously, that's your stall with flaps, too. I'm surprised that flaps and without flaps look like they're the same here. But anyway, 80, this is the kind of speed we're looking for. This is the configuration we're looking for. All right, levers are full. Let me come over here. Let me just trim that so I don't have to keep holding this. There's the dock down there we're going to go to. Let me trim that. There we go. It's trimmed. I don't have to touch it. Okay, beautiful. Now you can see both my levers are full, full propeller in case I have to do a go around and full rich already, heading down towards the sea level area. And now I'm just gonna drop it some more. We've got the right configuration. Drop it some more. That's when you wanna test that it's not gonna conk out on your idle. As I head down, I'm still doing 80 knots and I'm gonna come up to that dock up ahead there. That's the plan. Coming down to 80 knots, you can see my my uh, descent rate is around 1,000, like they said, and 80 knots. I'm getting a bit slower than that, and I'm going to just give it a bit more power. Get back up to 80. I've got full flaps on you guys, and then I'm going to touch down. I'm a little slower than they recommend, so I'm going to give it some more power. There we go. And then now I'm going to touch down, and I'll taxi back to the place. And now hold the stick back, cut power completely. Don't put the water, water rudders down yet. You can tell by the, fl the, fl the elevator at the back, my flaps, are, my elevator is all the way back, my yoke is all the way back, and of course I'm slowing down. I've got drag from the flaps, I got drag from the elevator, and the elevator's keeping the back of the pontoons in the water so the fronts don't dip. That's what the plan is. All right, so now from here, I can relax the yoke. From here, I want to put the water rudders down. Outside the plane, you can press Control w and down they go. Or from inside the plane, use that steel rod that you saw. Bring the flaps up to normal cruise. Set transponder, anything else you need to do while you're here. 
and now I'm going to turn around and go back to the dock. Now I want to show you while we're here too, I wanted to show you there's a normal cruise with rudder with rudders down in the water as I head back toward the dock. You can do a fast taxi also. You can get up to probably about 1600 here, right about there. You won't take off at that speed, but it gives you a nice fast taxi. All right, now at this point it's debatable. Some people will say not a good speed for your water rudders. It is hard on the water rudders when you're at this speed. So you might want to pull them up because you do have air, you have um, rudder authority and elevator authority at the back. So I can still steer and there I am turning on a step taxi. All right, I'm going to turn that back down again. A step taxi, of course, is the least amount of friction and the fastest way. It actually creates less wake too. It's better to do a fast taxi, but certainly as you approach a dock, you'll want to, you'll certainly want to uh, slow it down like I'm doing right now. I'm down to idle, we'll see how long it takes for me to slow down, and then I'll judge my approach from there. All right, I'll do a separate uh, segment here near the end of our session about how to approach the dock or sailing or whatever else we're going to do there. I don't think these docks, I don't think these docks have, um, they're, I don't think they're solid. All right, I'm just gonna cut the engine from here. Let them grab the rope as I come into the dock. And some people actually say, well, just give them more give them more flaps. And if you give more flaps, it'll slow you down. That's actually true. And now I have no rudder authority, even though I've got it cranked all the way left. It'll drift a bit, but now wind takes over. If I have wind here, it'll push me into that dock. For this demonstration, I'm going to use the Tundra tires off of uh, the BC interior. And just, uh, let's do, uh, at this point, let's just do stalls and uh, take it up to the practice area and have some fun with that. All right, we're all set for takeoff. We got takeoff flaps going. Pull the, pull the uh, yoke all the way back. I'm gonna pull back some audio on here so you can hear me back to about there. All right, full power, let go. You can see what's happening. We're moving. Tails up. And we are 40, 55. Up we go. That's our rotate speed. No retractable gear on here. Now we can set it to climb. Bring it up to climb position. There's climb position. And climb position is somewhere around there. I'm going to trim that and let it run. Beautiful. Look at that. Gorgeous. All right. So what we want to do is get some altitude going here. We want to go up a few thousand feet. And uh, to have some area that we can work in. I'm just going to pull this back now. Pull this back to 2,000. Take it easy on the, on the plane itself. So our practice area can be anywhere, shouldn't be over people, shouldn't be over water. It just gets hard to um, understand the difference between water and sky. It's just a precautionary thing. And uh, we're going to just go over some land somewhere and get the idea how that works. <clears throat> and what we want to do is we just want to do a couple of, um, you know, stalls, etc. Here at 3,000 feet, this gives us a couple of thousand. That's okay for stalls. It wouldn't be good for spins, but that'll work for stalls. So let's just level off. I'm going to raise the flaps now right up to cruise position, which is clean configuration. You can see the plane settle in its attitude. And I'm going to push the yoke forward, settle in somewhere around 34, 3500. Uh, let's just take it to 35. And from here now, we can just try a couple of things. Now, we should still do, we will still do the hazel check. Let's see what level of configuration looks like, something like that. Trim that around 3,500. Um, so what you want to do is, you know, hazel check. I'm going to just pull back some MP here to 29.7. I'm going to pull back the throttle to 2,000. We're good. And then trim that. It should be around 130 knots. And uh, I'm still climbing a bit too. Okay. Just wants to go. 
All right, so now I'm in the, you know, pretty much a level configuration. I want to look around now and actually do a hazel check. I'm in the, the, the height area security engine and lookout. So height is good. The area is good. It's pretty rural out here. Um, height area security. I'll make sure seat belts are attached, make sure doors are closed, make sure there are no loose objects. Um, engine, I'm going to look at the engine. I've already set it for cruise configuration somewhere around 3,500 feet and we'll just see how much we actually lose when we do this. Although I'm heading down the river area, I should actually go over somewhere like over there where there's, uh, you know, farmer's fields in case I ever have an engine failure and I have to put it down. It's probably the better area to do it. So during my lookout, I'll end up over some area like that. All right, so uh, height, area, engine, security, and then lookout. Lookout would just do like a 360, maybe even go back a little further. And as we do a 360 now, right now my heading is whatever it is, 1.5. So I'm just going to go to the left. I'm looking up, I'm looking over, I'm not using my head tracker right now, but I'm looking around for looking for traffic, looking up for traffic. The other person can help me also. A normal gentle turn doesn't have to be steep. And I'm trying to keep my altitude while I'm doing that. <clears throat> Wasn't even looking at that, but now I'll make sure I correct for it. And then, you know, once you're done that, you can either do a 360 or you can do two 180s. Sometimes two 180s is a good thing because then the pilot can look at both areas. But there's, there's always people who will comment about that. I'm going to just do a 360 or, in this case, a 180 back toward the farmer fields. And then I'll do my stall training from there. All right. So right here would be fine. I'm going to do my stall, stall tests right here. Stall training. Yeah, I'm going to train on it again for the first time. So what I want to do is first I'm going to do a power on stall. I'll just leave power the way it is. Up it goes. As we go up, we're going to lose speed. You can see the airspeed is starting to decrease. You can see I'm climbing quite a bit. This plane is made to climb. And you can see that there goes my airspeed. I'm just going to keep holding the yoke back. If it starts to, if the nose starts to fall, I'll hold it back some more. It's halfway back to my chest. It's about to stall any minute now. Look at how much. All right, there's the stall horn, five knots before, and right there I should start to fall. I got the yoke all the way back to my chest, and it falls off a wing. Nice and gentle, look at that. Just sort of mushes in until it picks up some speed. And we don't want to get into a spin, so let's just correct that with rudder. We got lots of speed here. Bring it back level and come back around. See where we are here. Yeah, we're good. We can stay in this area. Now I want to do a power off stall, get it level again, and I'm going to cut the power <clears throat> and do the same thing. In this case you typically try and keep your altitude like that. Pulling the yoke back, now it's halfway back to my chest, a little further back and we'll see what happens as we get close to stall. Stall horn, holding it all the way back. The yoke cannot go back any further and look at that, it just kind of mushes down to level. I cannot make this thing fall over. A wing won't fall on this configuration. You guys, the yoke is all the way back to my chest. I can't go any further. What a nice design. Now, you don't want that ringing in your ear. You don't want to stay in this stalled state, but it actually is a good feature they've built into it. All right, check it forward. Just release the yoke. Picks up a bit of speed. And of course, you can pick up the normal setting again. And we'll settle in at 3,000. As you can see, it's, a, it's been designed well, and the dynamics here in the simulator are working well, too. That's exactly what happens in the real beaver. Now, I want to do um, a steep turn to the left. We did a hazel check. There were no planes in the area. This remote area, there's nothing. And so now what I want to do is, I'm at 3,000 feet. Let me just level that up to 3,000. Or level that down, whatever works. And I've got the right settings here for my engine. We're good. And what I want to do now is I want to do a steep turn and see how it feels, all right? And typically on a steep turn, once I get past 30 degrees, I typically give it a little more power. Let's do a steep turn to the left first. All right, so here we go. Taking it up 15, 20 degrees or so. Here's 30 degrees. I'm actually gaining. I'm already pulling back on the yoke. <laughs> all right, let's see if I can keep that level. All right, as we pass 45, I'll just give it a little bit more shot of power and try to keep that altitude. I was at 3100 starting the turn and now I'll go into steep. And let's see how this works. There's steep, really nice and steep. Look at that. Take it a little more. Try and keep that 3100.
Okay, now we'll take it back for a landing. You can see the flashing light way over there where the airport is. We'll do a downwind and we'll do a landing with these Tundra tires, tailwheel landing three point. Now let's just come on in here for a downwind, approximately a thousand feet above. Be landing on runway one five, I think it is. Like that. Twenty nine point seven. Not from here, primer master mags on both. Temperature pressure is good. All circuit breakers are in. Switches are set. Landing lights on. Rock and roll. There's the airport. Gear down. There's no gear. <laughs> uh, mixture rich. Propeller full. Bring back some power. Slow it down as I head toward that runway. There's a good speed. I'll just bring it up a little bit. Trim it. And I'm turning to base. Normally make some calls from here. Just to give you guys an idea what it looks like. We'll come over from the side view like this. Awfully hard to fly a plane looking like this, but there we go. Level that up. And we're on base and we'll do a final in a second here. More flap. More flap. And one more flap. There we go. And we're in flap configuration. Alright. Speed's good. Trees? Wow. Alright. I'm going to do full flap. Rare to do that, but it really gives you a lot of drag. You can do a nice steep approach over these trees like that. Getting close to stall. And get the nose down. And cut some power right there. Little bounce. My Tundra tires are full of air. And let's just do that like that. here. A little light on the brakes. There we go. We're down. Flaps up. I did use steep flaps and I, I didn't round out quite enough but that's okay. Every landing you'll figure out what happened. Flaps are all the way up. Taxi. Typically, Tundra tires are underinflated to give you a bit of bounce now and then. There we go. Typically, you know, somewhere around 1600 is a good taxi speed, according to the POH, somewhere around there. Good taxi speed. Right there. Slow it down a bit. Now this plane could go across the grass easily, but you never know if it's wet grass. And away we go. Now if you think that's easy, managing a plane from an angle, <laughs> it is not. <laughs> anyway, that's how it's done. Normal shutdown, pull the mixture back. We're good. And we'll put mixture back. We're good. And I'll switch this go off. And parking brake on. Right here. Parking brake's on. Fuel's off. Perfect. And we're all set. Now it's your turn. So you can see from this list here, gather your checklist, your POH, and let's head to the airplane. You've seen demonstrations now in, in the different configurations. I would say pick the float plane first. It's simpler to take off and land. Uh, tail wheel is harder unless you know tail wheel techniques. And certainly a ski plane is a tail wheel technique, right? So I would say try the NFIB first. Uh, easier to take off and put back down on the runway. Walk around, run up and take off. And really go through the run-up steps, at least on my simple checklist. Go through the run-up steps. 
and uh, get a feel for how that's done. Now try some stalls and turns just to see what it's like. Uh, return to the airport for landing, do some touch and goes after that, and then go try the other variations, right? And uh, certainly the tail wheel seems to be challenging a lot of people, unless you've had skills on how to handle tail wheel. So how'd you do? Comments, suggestions for you beginners who have done this for the first time. Um, by all means, put your comments below. It'll help the rest of us understand different perspectives. It'll also help us if I've missed something here, by all means, add them in respectfully and we'll be having a look at that and we'll all learn from it, absolutely. Um, here, this is actually the Anfib version taking off. I took this screen snap because this is what the 40th anniversary brought to us. They brought us extra water effects like this. There always is this kind of spray up at the back of the plane. We didn't have it before the 40th anniversary. Look at how beautiful that is. It's just like real life for sure. These are grab ropes that you would grab once the plane is near the dock. That's what they're there for. And you would also, they have a loop in them. They, pro they probably have a, a, a special knot in them so that they don't come undone. A lot of people will put another rope through that loop and tie it off to a cleat somewhere. All right, homework, if there's time. Well, this is something you should try, you guys. You've seen some demonstrations now of different variations. Here I'm starting out way over here at Chilliwack, BC. This is where I've been doing a lot of this flying. Chilliwack, BC, you, earlier you saw me up at Hope and over at um, Harrison Springs. You notice in here, we're flying out of Chilliwack, we're hanging to the left, we're heading into the mountains, and we're heading down this canyon here, following the river all the way over to, this is um, Chilliwack Lake right here and that's the actual pictures of it right there here i am flying to the lake behind my mugshot here here i am arriving at the lake you can see the bit of a curve going around the lake like that that's the curve right around here and here you see me landing on the lake and then eventually taking off estimated flying time for this practice session is uh 15 minutes and the most breathtaking scenery you can imagine uh, amazing All right, thanks for your participation, everyone. In the YouTube videos, I don't get to see how many of you are trying these techniques. If you made it this far in the video, you're probably serious enough to go try these things. Keep your POH handy, keep your checklist handy, and um, those who are subscribers on my Twitch channel, on my Twitch channel, can have the PDF of this presentation for free. Um, and that's it. I just try to give a value add for those who actually um, spent money to subscribe to Twitch. Here on YouTube, your subscriptions don't cost you. But uh, let me know what you need. You'll see the other links for POH and checklist here already. And thank you, Blackbird Milviz, for an excellent product. I couldn't resist by putting this picture back in there again, but they certainly know what they're doing. Milviz has always been top-notch in the stuff that they've made. All right, everybody, that's the end of that. Contact me in any of the means. Um, directly in Discord is the best way, you guys, in the Discord link. Uh, if you're in Twitch, just type an exclamation point Discord and you'll get the link for Discord.